Good morning, it's good to be with you. So the title of this presentation is Religious Life and the Call to Love. Its subtitle easily could be Education into Virginity as a Stable Form of Life. And so what I would like to do during this next 30 minutes or so is to reflect with you a, a little bit. Um, you know, the question is, if virginity is a viable, not only viable, beautiful form of life that shows forth in some way what the essence of love is, uh, then the question becomes, what does education into this life look like? And, and so in some ways, the, the presentation I offer today is, is a little bit more practical um, in, in that sense. I'm looking very much at the implications of this theological reality that we, we call virginity. Now, my co-sisters in community know me. I'm, I'm a planner. I plan everything. Even if it's drinking coffee in the morning, it has to be planned. So I contacted Father earlier and tried to coordinate with him a little bit because I really just wanted to know what he was going to say. <laughs> And, and we had some communications, uh, and it, it, wasn't, it wasn't everything I had hoped because I wanted something very concrete and planned. However, <laughs> in, in God's wonderful providence, um, I, I find that what I have to say is, in, in some ways, is very complimentary because, uh, Father, thank you for your, your words. You really spoke very beautifully on what I would say um, is the existential reality of virginity. And, and that's not something I really have the time or luxury to address in my particular reflection. So, so everything in that regard has already been said, so I thank you. I'd like to begin, before I get into what is probably the most, um, most interesting part of this reflection, um, that, that point of education, I'd like to highlight two theological principles. And what I hope is, is that these principles actually give us a context for, for understanding what education into virginity should look like. And as I unpack this a little bit, I, I hope this becomes clear. <clears throat> so the first point I'd like to look at is the claim that religious life has a mission, not only for those who profess the life of the councils, but, but for the whole church and by extension for the whole world. The title of this panel is Consecrated Love for the Life of the World. So, so we already know that religious life exists not only for itself, but radically as a service. So that is the first point. The second point I'd like to look at is another claim that the heart of this mission of religious life lies within this particular tension that characterizes it as a state of life simply speaking, um, simply saying, what Pope John Paul II has described, a renunciation that is an affirmation. So religious life has a mission. This mission has to do with the fact that it's a renunciation, but also an affirmation. And then third, to take some time with you to ponder what an education into virginity looks like within the context of religious life. So point one, religious life on mission. Lumen Gentium in paragraph 43 tells us that religious life is a gift for the salvific mission of the church. In paragraph 44, we hear that religious are joined to the mystery of the church in a special way. And a very beautiful passage in that same paragraph the Constitution tells us that religious have the duty of implanting and strengthening the kingdom of God in souls. So that's just a very beautiful image of implanting, strengthening the kingdom of God in souls. Which, by the way, when the, when the documents, when the Vatican documents speak about the church being started someplace, the, the, the word that comes up more often than not is the word plant or implant which I think is important for us to know. I think so often we think about the church being established or erected, what have you, but um, in the first instance, the church has always implanted the, 
proclamation of the gospel is the seed that falls into the, what we hope is fertile ground. And what comes forth is, is the church. Lumen Gentium also tells us that religious life is an eschatological sign, that somehow this form of life witnesses to the resurrection and points to that reality that all of us will, will live in, in eternity. So if we put that all together, if we look at our first point, religious life, what is its mission? We hear that religious are inserted into the mystery of the church in a special way. We hear that religious life participates the life of eternity, the life of the church in eternity in an anticipatory way. And that somehow the special identification with the church enables religious, individual religious, but more importantly, religious as a state of life, that somehow it allows religious to implant the church to, or to communicate communicate to others the mystery, the reality, the essence of what and who the church is. Okay, so I'm going to leave that first point right there. We'll come back to that. So the second point is, is that religious life is a renunciation, but also an affirmation. As Father Prosperi said beautifully, it, Religious life is a renunciation of marriage and all its attendant joys in order to embrace the form of life assumed by Christ who is poor, chaste, and obedient. So it's the renunciation of intimacy with another and a spousal relationship that has the capacity to bear fruit, that is already fruitful. Now the question here though is, um, it becomes a little bit difficult at this point because we, you know, we, we know all of these things and then usually in, when we talk about how religious life is the fulfillment of human desire and the affirmation of the person, all of that, it, it's usually we, we go from this point of renunciation and we make this leap, this, this, I don't know if it's a warranted leap, but it's a leap across a chasm and we say, however, it also really fulfills the person. It's an affirmation of everything that marriage stands for. And my question is, well, how? And at this point, it's, it's very important to take a look at exactly what is being renounced and what is being affirmed. You know, uh, otherwise we get all tangled up and we end up, uh, we end up saying something and buying into something that maybe for us in our lived reality has no real substance. So let's just take a look at this. Um, and this is where Pope John Paul II helps us, as he does with many other things. I'm referring to one of his Wednesday catechesis. On May 5th, 1982, he, he spoke these words, and I'm paraphrasing here. You'll have to look it up um, to, to, to get his, his words verbatim. But John Paul II tells us that religious life highlights what is most lasting and most profoundly personal in the conjugal vocation. So religious life highlights what is most lasting and most profoundly personal in the conjugal vocation. At this point, if we take that claim seriously, we have to say that there's something about virginity that strikes very deeply into the very, excuse me, into the very root of the mystery of love. There's something about virginity that strikes very deeply into the root of the mystery of love. So there's something about virginity that shows what love is. So that question of what is renounced and what is affirmed then I would say virginity itself as a state of life shows this, that love in any state of life renounces any claim on the beloved. OK, 
Okay, so virginity points to the fact that love in any state of life renounces any claim on the beloved. Precisely as an affirmation that the other in the first place belongs to God. As an affirmation that in the first place the other belongs to God. If we just look at the phenomenon of, of love, of, of falling in love, of a feeling affection or feeling drawn to a certain person, and this could be a man for a woman, a woman for a man, it could be in the context of friendship. You know, we've all experienced it, so there's that moment of attraction and fascination. There's something about that other person we never can get enough. So we want to spend all our time with them. We want to know, you know everything about this person. You know, just all of a sudden, the person who is in love has all these new interests. Um, things that were never fascinating or interesting before, all of a sudden, are um, just consuming. So it's in this moment that there's always a risk involved, because in drawing near, there's always the risk of a certain grasping that, that ruins in the end the promise of that friendship that ruins the, the capacity of this relation to, to really find this place where this, this reciprocal exchange can happen. So in that moment, what love has to know, or the one who loves has to know, is that there's some sort of there's a restraint that's necessary, not because what, hap what, what is happening is not beautiful, but because it is beautiful. So love has to abstain from closing in on the beloved, as it were, and instead has to place itself in the position of waiting for the beloved to respond. Now, you can't make someone love you you might want to, but you can't. And if you do, it something about the coercion that they, under, they undergo actually undermines what you really want. Because what you want isn't simply that person's affection. What you really want is that person for, uh, to, to give you that affection freely. Okay. So religious life as a form, virginity as a form of life, embodies the renunciation implicit in love. It, it takes that moment, it, it takes that, that discipline that love entails, if, if you will, if you want to call it that, and freezes it into, into a, a stable form of life um, such that the witness of love abides forever. So religious life is a sign of what is to come. It's, it's a sign of eternity, a sign of what the church will be forever. And what that means is, is that religious life is a sign of, of the fulfillment of love. Now, let me see, what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm going to just keep going, and I'll recap as I go. This, um, I think this might be the best way to proceed. Right now, I'm going to segue a little bit into what an education into virginity looks like. And really, the only concrete example and experience I have of this is my own community. And so I'm grateful that none of my co-sisters are here, because <laughs> they, they won't know everything that I said about them. Um, so. What I hope to do is draw in some, some of the things that we've been doing or trying, some of the things that I have noticed in terms of our efforts um, for formation, our efforts for living in community. Um, now, having said that, I, I don't want to get into things that are so detailed. What I hope to do is, by drawing on some of these examples, I hope to highlight some universal struggles or some, uh, some things that I see as 
as efforts that need to be made everywhere on the part of all of us, regardless of what state of life we might we might be vowed to or might be on our way toward. There's, an, uh, there's a priest, his name is Amadeo Cencini, and he, he writes extensively in Italian, and he's, he's also a psychologist, so some, some of what I'm going to say actually comes from more of that, that discipline. However, he has coined a, a phrase that I like very much, and he said for those vowed to the virginal life, he said they actually, he said we have a certain relational style. Okay. And when I read that, I thought, I, I don't know. Um, it just, it sounds a little bit too specific. But the more I read, I, I, I do, I, there are many things that he says that are very valuable. And what he, he characterizes this relational style as having a light touch. He said, those who vow a life of virginity interact with others and live among others in their speaking, in their, um, in their silence, in, in their work, even in their recreation, they, they have somewhat of a light touch. And the way he defines the light touch is, is that a person has a light touch when he can come close without invading, without invading the other. And, and if you think about that, that that's true for all of us. It, it, that's, this is not something unique to, to virginity. However, this goes back to my point that there's something about virginity that, that discloses the very heart of love, that love does not possess in a grasping way. And so if we want to look objectively at the actions and the, kind of the manner in, in which such an attitude might be in flesh, then, then it, I think his, his phrase, the light touch, is very apropos. Okay, so. So what does that mean? In terms of having a light touch, I think the first place we go to in our thinking has to do with interpersonal relations. Well, it has to do with the fact that, you know, I, I relate to, to people this way or that way, especially as women religious, the way we relate to men, the way we relate to priests and to, to those men we might have interactions with in, in the apostolate. But apart from that, there, there's a whole nother, I mean, virginity is an entire life, and so the implications of being vowed to a life of virginity has its, its fingerprints everywhere, if you will. Um, one thing I would say in just working with my own sisters in helping to, to guide them and listening to them in, you know, we always have all these struggles and I just, I wish I could take them all away, but, but I can't, first of all. And, and second, it, it wouldn't be a good thing because with, with the freedom to which we are invited in Christ, it's, it, it's a hard-won freedom. We have to traverse all kinds of obstacles in order to arrive where we want to be with Christ. And, and so in a sense, I, I don't begrudge my co-sisters or myself any of these struggles. So let me just touch some of these things that I've noticed that in our own community, in my own experience of living religious life that are that are challenges for us. And the, all of these things relate back to what it means to have a light touch. So, okay, 10 months ago, we started a, a renovation process. And 10 months ago, I told the sisters it was gonna take two months. So it's, <laughs> it's taken really a very long time. And I, I didn't realize at the time how difficult it would be. So everyone was displaced, everyone. The first floor of our convent, that the rooms were renovated, so I just assumed the first floor people would be going elsewhere. Well, well, everyone went elsewhere because the first floor people went up to the second floor, so the second floor people are living somewhere. Um, I see them every day for prayer, so they must be someplace close. <laughs> So it, it, everything has been displaced, and I didn't realize how important space is to have an ordered place to live. You know, you get up, you, you know where things are, you know where your room is, you know where, where to expect people. Well, what I realized in, with that experience is, is that space carries a certain meaning. Okay, space carries a certain meaning. For some reason, our ordered space turned into chaos, and so people couldn't even remember where their rooms were. 
so a space carries a certain meaning. And the reason I say that is, is because increasingly I find that we have difficulty remaining in silence. We have difficulty remaining in prayer. We're always looking for the next interesting thing. Um, there's a lot of diversion everywhere. Um, a lot more words. I, I feel like there are words everywhere, but at the same time, no one's saying anything. So I don't... <laughs> Maybe it's just my own experience. Um, so, so, so the question then becomes, if we're going to live this life in, together, I mean, w what does this look like for us? This, this life in community, which you know, we were all brought together because we, we vowed to Christ to the Lord that we would live poor, chaste, and obedient. So what, what I've discovered is, is that it, it, in terms of cultivating this light touch, we have to be able to experience a certain emptiness as a positive thing. We have to be able to enter into all those silent places. We have to be able to um, kind of dwell within these empty spaces as as, as places that can bear fruit, okay. So these spaces, what do we make of them? You know, is the space just something to be overcome? Is it something to be filled up? So what is this space? Is it full of anxiety? Is it full of reverence? I think Chen Chenyi would say that this light touch has to do with, with, the, with the reverence. We approach others with a certain reverence. And that the way that I, I hold myself, I hold myself back just a little bit because I don't want to flood them with simply my own ideas, my own opinions, my own overwhelming feelings, that I want to give them space to be able to give themselves to me and to present themselves and not to be afraid to share. So there are a whole host of implications here. Um, if I think about how our sisters, you know, we, uh, of, of, of course we, uh, the, the pillar of our education into our life is really the councils, poverty, chastity, and obedience. But um, the central pillar, I find, needs to have a lot of supports. And, and this is where we, we do talk about these different elements of prayer, liturgy, uh, relations within community. Um, we can also talk about the order of the day. You know, we, um, we follow a certain schedule. Uh, from what I've seen, nobody likes it. <laughs> And it's as it should be because what the order of day is meant to do is free up a space that's, um, that's apart from people's personal preferences. You know, if we're really going to have a time where we can be together profoundly, it, it needs to be a place where we all can meet. And that typically means that it has to be some place that is not controlled by, by someone's idiosyncrasies, um, someone's small preferences and all of those types of things. And so um, many, many things here, which I, I, I could go on and on. However, at this point, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start connecting some of these points because I see I'm close to 30 minutes. Um, so religious life as a form of consecrated life has a mission. Specifically, I would say for the persons who profess vows. Uh, I mean, religious life is for my own sanctification. I've vowed poverty, chastity, and obedience because it's my personal path to holiness. It's my personal path to the Lord. But as we know that no vocation is solitary, that my sanctification has to do with your sanctification, that somehow what's for me is also poured out for others. And so that is very true, not specifically even for the people that we encounter every day in our apostolates, although I hope there too that we are able to bring them something and the Lord is able to enrich them somehow. But even apart from that direct service, if you will, as a state of life, religious life, the life of consecration does have a particular mission in the church. It shows that love renounces possession of the other 
for the sake of communion. And that this truth of love is enough to, to build a life, enough to, to build a life with others, which is the rigor now of building life in community, which in turn, there are so many parts to all of that. Um, we, as I've said, there's the life inside, the, the life in the apostolate, which I really have not touched at all. Um, however, I, uh, my priority really is the life within community with my own co-sisters, because if we don't have it amongst ourselves, we'll never have anything to give. So I would just like to end this reflection by, um, by asking um, that we just all pray for each other and, and may we be more and more who we should be so that whatever vocation we have might be embraced for, for the sake of all. So I thank you for your kind attention.